Chapter 2 Then came the night of the first falling star. It was seen early in the morning, rushing over Winchester, eastward, a line of flame high in the atmosphere. Many people in Surrey saw it, later describing how it left a greenish streak behind it that glowed for some seconds. Some said it travelled with a hissing sound. I was at home in working at that hour, writing in my study. Although my French windows faced towards Ottershaw, I saw nothing of it. Yet this strangest of all things that ever came to earth from outer space must have fallen while I was sitting there, visible to me, had I only looked up as it passed. No one seems to have troubled to look for the fallen mass that night, but very early in the morning, poor Ogilvy found it soon after dawn not far from the sandpit. The impact of the projectile had made an enormous hole and the sand and gravel had been flung violently in every direction over the heath. The heather was on fire and a thin blue smoke rose against the dawn. The thing itself lay almost entirely buried in sand amidst the scattered splinters of a fir tree. The uncovered part had the appearance of a huge cylinder caked over by a thick, scaly, dun-coloured incrustation. It had a diameter of about 30 yards. Ogilvy approached the mass, surprised at the size and more so at the shape, since most meteorites are rounded more or less completely. It was, however, still too hot to approach. Ogilvy remained standing at the edge of the pit, staring at the thing's strange appearance. The early morning was wonderfully still, and the sun, just clearing the pine trees towards Weybridge, was already warm. The only sounds were the faint movements from within the cindery cylinder. He was all alone on the common. Then, suddenly, he noticed that some of the grey clinker, the grey, ashy incrustation that covered the meteorite, was falling off the circular edge of the end. Flakes were raining down upon the sand. A large piece suddenly came off and fell with a sharp noise that brought his heart into his mouth. For a minute he scarcely realised what this meant. Ignoring the heat, he clambered down into the pit, close to the bulk, to see the thing more clearly. Why was the ash falling only from the end of the cylinder? And then he saw that the circular top of the cylinder was rotating very slowly on its body. He heard a muffled grating sound. In a flash, he realised that the cylinder was artificial, hollow, with an end that screwed out. Something within the cylinder was unscrewing the top. Good heavens, said Ogilvy. There's a man in it, men in it, half roasted to death, trying to escape. Instinctively, he moved forward to try to help. But luckily, the heat forced him back before he could burn his hands on the still glowing metal. Ogilvy scrambled out of the pit, running wildly in the direction of Woking. On the road, he met a man driving a wagon. Ogilvy tried to make him understand, but the tale he told and his appearance were so wild. His hat had fallen off in the pit that the man simply drove on. Ogilvy kept running. Reaching the outskirts of Woking, he saw Henderson, the London journalist, in his garden. Henderson, he called. You saw that shooting star last night? 
Henderson stood up with his spade in his hand. Well, he said, it's out on Horshall Common now. Good Lord, said Henderson. Ball and meteorite? That's good. But it's something more than a meteorite. It's a cylinder, an artificial cylinder, man. And there's something inside. Henderson dropped his spade, snatched up his jacket and came out into the road. The two men hurried back at once to the common. They found the cylinder still lying in the same position. But the sounds inside had ceased and a thin circle of bright metal showed between the top and the body of the cylinder. Air was entering or escaping at the rim with a thin sizzling sound. Henderson rapped on the scaly burnt metal with a stick. When there was no response, they both concluded that the man or men inside must be unconscious or dead. The two men went back to the town again to get help. One can imagine them covered with sand, running up the little street in the bright sunlight, just as the shop folks were taking down their shutters and people were opening their bedroom windows. Henderson went into the railway station at once in order to telegraph the news to London. By eight o'clock, a number of boys and unemployed men were already travelling to the common to see the dead men from Mars. I heard the story first from my newspaper boy. I was naturally startled and lost no time in going out and across the Ottershaw Bridge to the sandpits. <laughs>